In this session, we're going to do a quick overview of the cranial nerves. You should have your sheet printed out in A3 and have some markers nearby. So we're going to start off with the first cranial nerve, the olfactory. And the olfactory nerve is an extension of the central nervous system. Um, there is a little bulb that sits approximately here, just above the cribriform plate, which you can see here is this little sieve-like plate of bone filled with holes. And coming from this olfactory bulb, we have a tract, the olfactory tract, which goes back to the brain. The olfactory nerves themselves pass through this cribriform plate to get into the bulb. So they will be innervating the mucosa here in the nasal cavity. OK, so we know the cribriform plate. And we know the olfactory nerve. Let's move on to the second cranial nerve. This is the optic nerve. For the optic nerve, we can see that we have this X shaped structure, which sits approximately here in the skull, just superior to this little hollow called the pituitary fossa. Um, and this X shaped structure is called the chiasm. What is it for? Well, we have our optic nerves here and here, right and left, and we have our two optic tracts here going back to the brain. And the chiasm allows a little bit of crossing over of fibres. So, for example, if we're looking at something that's over on this side of our vision, the light will come in, it'll hit the retina on this side, that'll travel in this optic nerve, and it can cross over. If we see the same uh, object, and the other eye, it'll cross over, it'll hit the more lateral side here in the retina, um, and it'll stay on its own side. So this means that when we go back to the cortex, our, our visual cortex at the back, we have two images of the same structure. By comparing those two images, we can say if the structure has been further away or closer, because the further away it is, the more similar those two images are going to be. Um, and this allows us to construct binocular vision. We're also going to have some aspects of uh, this information that's coming in through these nerves feeding back to other systems in the brain, such as our sleep-wake cycle. So it's not just important for vision. OK, so now we move on to the third cranial nerve. This is our oculomotor. And as the name would suggest, oculo eye motor movement, it's controlling the muscles that move the eye. These two cranial nerves here, four and six, will also help with that action. Therefore, we can say, we can sit them together, three, four, six, makes my eyes do tricks. So they move the eye. In addition to that, the oculomotor nerve will also have some parasympathetic innervation. So if you want to draw a little eye, and this time the pupil, is constricted. So this is another function of our oculomotor nerve. It will constrict the pupil. Um, and this parasympathetic function um, is important in what's called the pupillary light reflex. So our pupillary light reflex involves two cranial nerves in a reflex, cranial nerve two, which detects light, and cranial nerve three, which constricts the pupil in response to that light. We'll just mention where those nerves are passing through the skull. So for the optic, we have the optic canal, which is just here. And if we were to imagine the chiasm, um, that's approximately where it would be. So our optic canal is going to go into the orbit um, and it's bringing the signals from the retina back to this optic nerve, back to the chiasm. The oculomotor nerve is going to pass through this elongated fissure. So is the trochlear nerve and so is the obducens nerve. OK, so three, four and six will pass through this fissure, which is called the superior orbital fissure. And that also gets it to the orbit. So let's have a look now at the next, which is the trigeminal. First off, we have three divisions. This is where it gets its name, trigeminal, so three roots. So here's the three roots. We have V1, V2, V3. The V um, refers to the fact that it's the fifth cranial nerve. V1 is also called the ophthalmic, V2 the maxillary, and V3 the mandibular. All of these have sensory components, 
and only V3 also has motor. In terms of the sensory components um, for all three of these, you have areas of the face that are going to be supplied by these three divisions, um, and you can draw them out. So first of all, from the tip of the nose to the upper eyelid, this is going to be V1. V2 then is going to be the lower eyelid, this lower part of the face, all the way uh, to our, our upper lip. So this is V2. And then remaining at the bottom, our lower lip, bits of the ear, bits of the temple up here, the jaw, this will be V3. So that's the sensory innovation of the face, the skin of the face on the outside, but it will also contribute to sensory innovation of internal uh, structures such as the eyelids, um, the cheek mucosa, also the eardrum or tympanic membrane, your teeth and the gums. So it's very important for um, sensory innovation outside and in. That gives it a function here in this corneal link reflex is what protects your cornea covering of your eye. So if something pokes the cornea, you blink in response. So what two nerves are involved in that? Well, the sensory innovation coming from our trigeminal nerve, and then we close the eyelid using the facial nerve, which we'll talk about in a bit, the seventh cranial nerve. Some of the nerves here that are helping to distribute these um, trigeminal cranial nerve neurons include our supraorbital nerve, we have our infraorbital nerve, uh, we have our mental nerve coming out here, zygomatico-temporal, zygomatico-facial. Um, so lots of little branches of cutaneous nerves emerging to supply the skin of the face. So another function of this V3 division is going to be motor innervation. Um, and I suppose what it's most associated with is the muscles of mastication. This is the muscles that allow you to chew. So if we draw them onto these two images here and here, we'll draw the two pterygoid muscles here and the two kind of more superficial ones here, which is the masseter and the temporalis. And master will attach here on the angle of the mandible, a little bit on the ramus, and here on the zygomatic arch. So if you were to draw it, it'll go like that. And what you'll notice about the direction of these fibres is that they mostly point in a, a vertical direction, but they do have a little bit uh, of a projection going from posterior to anterior as well. And this means that they will aid in protrusion of the mandible, as well as elevation of the mandible, closing the mouth. The temporalis muscle is going to attach to this little projection, mostly hidden by the zygomatic arch there. This is the coronoid process. So we're going to draw the fibres fanning out from this coronoid process, running under the zygomatic arch and attaching all along this temporal fossa. It attaches along the temporal lines that you can see there on the parietal bone and the temporal fossa itself of the parietal bone and the sphenoid. So this is the coronoid process of the mandible. Um, and they're going to pull that posteriorly. And this means that they'll also help with retraction of the mandible. So they'll elevate and they'll retract, whereas with our meseter it was protraction, also known as protrusion. And protraction being held by meseter, but together they work to close the mouth, to elevate the mandible. Next we want to look at the two pterygoid muscles and they're going to attach to this bony plate. This is the lateral pterygoid plate. And we have two muscles here, we have our medial pterygoid and our lateral pterygoid muscles. So the medial pterygoid is probably easier because it looks um, a little bit like the masseter in that it's going to attach to the angle of the mandible, but on the inside. So we'll just draw dots to represent that. So it's attaching there on the inside of the mandible on the angle, and it's running up to this pterygoid plate. But the medial pterygoid muscle, um, it's attaching to the medial side of this plate. So if you're following it, it's going to go like this. OK, so we can imagine um, again the direction of these fibres is like this. 
So it's going to help to uh, close the mouth. Um, and if you think about just say the first syllable of medial, your mouth is closed. Whereas if you say the first, first syllable of lateral pterygoid, you open your mouth. So that's one way to remember the difference in these two muscles. But the medial pterygoid will help to close the mouth. And also because of the direction of its fibre is going like this, it will also help with protrusion. In terms of uh, describing its attachments up here, it's going to attach to the lateral pterygoid plate on the medial side. And also it has an attachment there as well to the maxilla. So uh, this here is called the maxillary tuberosity, just beside your upper wisdom teeth. Next, the lateral pterygoid muscle. So our lateral pterygoid muscle this time, it has two parts to it. So the first part is going to attach up here on this bone, this is the sphenoid. And then the second part or the inferior part is going to attach on the lateral side of this plate, the lateral side of the lateral pterygoid plate. And in terms of what it's going to go back and attach to, it has to attach the mandible. All these muscles of mastication have to attach to the mandible. So the upper head will go back like this. And it'll attach to a disc that we have within this joint called an articular disc um, and also the joint itself. So the capsule that's around this temporomandibular joint. OK, so it helps to pull the articular disc forward and helps to pull this condyloid process forward as well. Um, some people refer to it as the head and the neck of the mandible. OK, so the other head, which is attaching to this lateral pterygoid plate, is going to go back and attach to this condyloid process, the, the neck of the mandible. Um, and it's going to go straight back like that. And one of the things that you'll notice about this muscle of mastication compared to the others is that it's pretty transverse in its direction. So all of the others have a bit of verticality to it, but this one is running from anterior to posterior. And this means that in terms of its function, it's going to pull the head of the mandible here forward. So uh, it'll help with protraction. And by doing that, by dragging the head of the mandible here along uh, this little faucet it sits in, it also helps to open the mouth. So if you think lateral, say la, your mouth is open. So it's going to help to open the mouth, whereas the other three have to close it. OK, so then we're on to this little diagram here. This is some of the other muscles that will be innervated by the trigeminal. We'll draw them in. So first off, we're going to have a muscle that runs along here, along the floor of the mandible. This is meant to be a mandible. This is the other side of the mandible. And we have a muscle that basically covers all of this area. And that muscle is called mylohyoid. It's attaching along a line here in the mandible and the mandible on the other side, um, and it's fusing with its counterpart here in the midline so that the two sides come together. And it also has attachment here on this bone. This is the hyoid. We have another muscle then called the digastric. So the digastric has two bellies, as the name would suggest. One of the bellies will attach here in the digastric fossa, which is on the internal aspect of your chin. It'll run back this anterior belly and there will be a little sling tendinous slip that it passes through and that's hitched to the hyoid and then the rest the posterior belly it goes back and attaches here pretty medially onto the mastoid notch on the medial aspect of the mastoid process now it's important that we remember the v3 division this mandibular division doesn't supply both bellies of digastric and um, it'll only supply this anterior belly okay so the anterior belly of digastric. OK, the posterior belly is innervated by the facial nerve. We'll do that in a second. Another thing that we can see in this picture is the tongue, an extra aspect to the sensory innervation of this trigeminal nerve, which is that it helps to supply a touch sensation to the tongue, not taste, but touch, um, but only to the anterior two thirds. The taste sensation is actually going to come from the facial nerve. So our facial nerve and our trigeminal nerve work together to innervate some structures. So this other structure that we have here above the tongue, this is the soft palate. And there are a couple of muscles associated with that. Some that will help to raise it up or elevate it um, and some that will help to tense it once it is elevated. And that 
serves an important function in closing off the nasopharynx so that when you're eating food, nothing goes up your nose. And the relevant one here is going to be the tensor veli palatini. And what that means, veli is soft, palatini refers to the palate, and tensor is to tense it. So this is a muscle innervated by V3, which helps to tense the soft palate. Um, and it's confusing as to how it does it from this angle, but basically it runs down laterally, and then it runs, um, if, you, if you imagine, kind of out at us, coming out this way. And so by contracting, it pulls on either side of the soft palate. In terms of what it's going to attach to, it actually attaches to that pterygoid plate, but the medial pterygoid plate this time, um, and it's going to run into the soft palate, attaching to the palatine aponeurosis. So this V3 division helps to innervate this tensor vela uh, palatini. It also innervates another muscle beginning with T, and this is the tensor tympani. And what you're going to associate the tensor tympani with is the ear. So if you go into the ear and you see the eardrum, the tensor tympani is going to attach uh, to a, a little oscill, a little bone that attaches to the eardrum. And when it contracts, it can tighten the eardrum, which means that if we have very loud sounds coming in to our ear, we can tense that. And that means that it interrupts some of that energy, some of that vibration going into our inner ear. So it's protective. And this is called the tympanic reflex. So we hear a loud sound, something like chewing or shouting. We contract this tensor tympani muscle that tightens the eardrum and protects our inner ear. OK, so before moving on, we're going to add um, those nerves that we've covered so far to this picture. Uh, our trigeminal nerve. Our trigeminal nerve, it sits in this little middle cranial fossa um, and it has a ganglion which is a little swelling where all the cell bodies are located. And we're going to have our first division coming off V1, then V2, and then V3. So V1 is actually passing through the superior orbital fissure. We know that one already. That's where cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 pass through. The V2 division goes through a foramen called foramen rotundum. And V3 passes through a foramen, which is not as round or rotund as that foramen, it's a bit oval, so it's foramen ovale. There's actually a small bit of V3 that comes back into the cranium, so it passes up through this little tiny opening that you can see there, um, and that's called foramen spinosum. Why does it do that? Well, if we go back to the sensory list that we have here, we can add another thing to that list, which is the meninges. So the meningeal branch of V3 comes back into the skull to help to supply the dura mater, one of the meningeal layers. If we look at this little image here, so this is just uh, the cranial nerves as they emerge. So this is our olfactory, this is our optic, this is our ocular motor, this is our trochlear, this is our abducens down here. So three, four, six, make my eye do tricks. And then this large one here with the three branches coming off it, that's our trigeminal. OK, so now we're moving on to the next half, first looking at our facial nerve. And I suppose what the facial nerve is most known for is it moves your face. Uh, when thinking about the actions of facial nerve, it's probably easiest to think of someone with Bell's palsy. So what does someone with Bell's palsy have? They have a, a droopy face, so they have facial paralysis. Usually they would have a dry eye. They may have to tape their eyes shut at night time. They might have a dry mouth. They may, might have altered taste. Um, and actually as well, they can sometimes have something called hyperacusis, which means a sensitivity to noise. So by looking at these symptoms and thinking about someone that has these symptoms, we can figure out the functions of the facial nerve. So first off, um, if we look at this little diagram here and if we can draw in some tears, that will help us to remember that one of the functions of the facial nerve is it supplies the lacrimal gland. And supplies it with parasympathetic innervation. So it helps to tell that gland to secrete tears. 
You could also draw this person drooling because it'll also supply our sublingual and submandibular salivary glands. So they help with producing saliva and that's also parasympathetically driven. So that explains the dry eye, the dry mouth. Um, what about the altered taste? Well, we mentioned this briefly when we looked at the trigeminal. We said the trigeminal supplies touch sensation to the anterior two thirds, while the taste sensation to the anterior two thirds of your tongue is innervated by the facial. So this explains the altered taste. What about the hyperacusis? Well, if we look into the ear, we have, um, again, our little eardrum. We have a little oscill coming off, attaching to the eardrum. Another little oscill, and then finally, a little stapes, the tiniest bone in your body. And attaching to that stapes, there's a muscle called stapedius. And the stapes then will attach to the, the inner ear, or a cochlea, um, and transmits sound vibrations that hit the eardrum into oscill vibrations and then eventually into fluid waves within the inner ear. And what the stapedius does is it attaches to the stapes and much in the same way as the tensor tympani, it can hold that stapes stable and reduce the intensity of uh, the energy going into the inner ear. So again, it's protective. So if we have a loud noise, or which is detected by this nerve, actually, the vestibular cochlear, the eighth, then our stapedius reflex, also sometimes called the um, acoustic reflex, causes the stapedius to contract uh, to protect us. OK, so this is mediated by the seventh cranial nerve, the motor arm. So that explains the hyperacusis. You're not able to protect yourself from these loud noises, so everything sounds very loud. Another function of the facial nerve will be motor innervation. Um, and you can see some of the muscles here that it's going to be innervated and we're going to draw the others. So let's label these ones first. One of them we should know already. This is the digastric muscle. Um, and this belly that we're looking at here, this is the posterior belly of the digastric. Um, and it's attaching there to that medial side of the mastoid process. Um, but also the facial nerve will innervate this little muscle beside it. And that muscle there is called the stylohyoid. So if you think about them in pairs, so our mylohyoid and our anterior belodigastric, they were both innervated by trigeminal nerve. Whereas these two, which go together here posteriorly, um, the stylohyoid, which comes from the styloid process, attaches to the hyoid, as well as the posterior digastric, those are both facial. The next thing we want to do is to draw in the muscles of facial expression. So this is a, a very important function of the facial nerve and one of the most uh, easily recognisable symptoms of Bell's palsy, the drooping face. So first off, we'll draw in uh, a muscle here, one that's commonly paralysed on purpose when uh, people take Botox. This is the frontal belly of occipitofrontalis. It has a frontal belly here in the forehead region, and then it has uh, an aponeurosis that extends over the top of the head. So that's the epicranial aponeurosis. And the epicranial aponeurosis extends back to the occipital region back here, and then that's where we have our occipital belly. So it'll attach to the occipital bone, where it's attaching to the skin here of the forehead. So when the frontal belly contracts, you can imagine it will lift the skin of the forehead um, and the occipital belly will also pull on this epicranial aponeurosis, lifting the skin of the forehead and causing wrinkles. What type of wrinkles? Transverse forehead wrinkles and raising of the eyebrows. Next, we're going to draw two of the big sphincter muscles um, and these are around the eye and around the mouth. OK, so this one that's around the eye is called orbicularis oculi. And it's not to be confused with orbicularis oris, which is around the mouth. Um, and they're sphincter muscles, so they're going to close those openings. 
Um, so in the case of the orbicularis oculi, it has a part which is here at the eyelids. Um, and that's responsible for soft closing, involuntary and voluntary soft closing of the eyelid when you blink and so on. That's called the palpebral part. You have a small lacrimal part that attaches to the lacrimal bone and helps with drainage of tears. And then the rest of this large circular fibres, um, this is the orbital part and it's going to attach to the skin around the orbit. Um, and it's inserting here on the frontal bone and the nasal bone and the maxilla. Um, and what it does is it scrunches up the skin around your eye to protect your eye. So it helps to forcefully close the eye. With this sphincter, the orbicularis oris, um, it's going to surround the mouth. So by contracting, it can close the mouth and protrude the lips. There's a little fibromuscular bundle just there at the corner of the mouth called the modulus. And that's an attachment point for lots of these muscles that we'll talk about, including this one. We also have aspects of orbicularis oris in the lips themselves, so they're also made up of, uh, partly made up of muscle. Okay, if we add um, another little muscle up here, which is running pretty vertical, that's called the procerus. What does procerus do? Well, it pulls uh, the skin of the forehead down towards the nasal bone where it attaches, and this produces transverse wrinkles that you can find between the eyes. So it helps with frowning. Next, we have a muscle associated with the nose. So this will be running here like this um, along the, the bridge of the nose. Um, and we actually have some of its fibers as well attaching here to some of the alar cartilages of the nose. And that's called nasalis. So nasalis has two parts to it. The part that we have here, it's going to attach to the nasalis on the other side by a little nasal aponeurosis. Um, and it's coming from the maxilla just here. So it helps to compress the nasal opening. If you look at the lower part of it, it is going to attach the alar cartilage and it pulls it out. So it helps to open or flare the nostril, which is important for things like conveying anger, but also exercise when you're breathing in so hard that your nose is almost sucking itself closed. So the nasalis helps to open the nostril and also to compress the nasal opening. If we then uh, look at some of the muscles associated with the mouth, so we're going to have uh, two muscles that go from the corners of the mouth and down like this at an angle. And these are the levator and depressor anguli. Oris. And they do what they say on the tin, they're going to elevate or depress the angle of the mouth. And they fuse here with the orbicularis oris and the modiolus. We also have the muscle fibers that run up in this direction. They will help to elevate the lip. And we're going to have some muscles that will help to depress the lower lip. They will be levator, levi superioris and depressor labi inferioris. Okay, so they pull the lower lip uh, down, upper lip up. Another two little muscles that we have here, which blend in with some of this orbicularis oris and the modiolus, include zygomaticus minor and zygomaticus major. So the zygomaticus muscles will help to elevate the corner of the lip and the, the upper lip itself. So that's important for something like smiling. Another muscle that we have here in this chin area is going to be the mentalis. So the mentalis, what it does is it attaches to the skin here inferiorly and goes up to attach to the mandible. So what it does is it pulls the skin of the chin up. That helps to protrude the lower lip and it also causes a little dimpling on the skin of the chin that you can see when you protrude your your lower lip. Another muscle that we'll draw in here is the patisma. And the patisma is going to go from the tissues overlying the clavicle, so supraclavicular and infraclavicular uh, subcutaneous tissue. And it goes up and attaches to the mandible and also some of the skin here on the mandible as well. So what is it going to do? It can tense the skin of the neck and cause uh, a raised kind of appearance of the patisma. 
which is important for conveying frustration and anger, but can also help to open the mouth by depressing the mandible. The last muscle that we will mention is a muscle that you have here in this cheek region, which is the buccinator. Is the buccinator. And what the buccinator would attach to is the pterygoid process superiorly, the mandible inferiorly, and extending between those two structures, you'll have the pterygomandibular raphe, where it'll blend with some of the constrictor muscles of the pharynx so that the whole area is closed off. So food is coming in with the buccinator pushing the food against the teeth and the food goes back to the pharynx. So it's a continuous tube for it to pass through. So that's our facial nerve. The vestibulocochlear nerve is going to innervate two structures, the vestibule and the cochlea. And these are important for balance and hearing. In terms of which part is which, so our vestibule is this portion and the cochlea is this coiled portion. So for seven and eight, what opening in the skull do they pass through? And the answer is this one here, the internal acoustic meatus. Meatus is just a passageway. So the internal acoustic meatus is so called because this is on the inside. So we're going to have our cochlea and our vestibule in this area in the temporal bone. So signals are coming back through that little opening to get back to the brain. Our facial nerve is also bringing um, some sensory innervation back from the tongue, but it's also giving motor innervation, which is going to pass along that nerve, the facial nerve, into the internal acoustic meatus. And then it passes through something called the facial canal. And the facial canal will eventually lead it to a foramen called the stylomastoid foramen. And that'll come out between the styloid process and the mastoid process. That's where we get our branches here to supply the muscles of facial expression. OK, so we move on next to the ninth cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal. This is the parotid gland, which means par around otted the ear, otis, um, and it's a salivary gland. So again, you can draw someone drooling. It's the largest salivary gland, so it works with our sublingual and our submandibular that were up there innervated by the facial to produce saliva. In addition to supplying the parotid gland with parasympathetic innervation, telling it to secrete saliva, the glossopharyngeal nerve will also supply the posterior third of the tongue with both taste and touch sensation. So cranial nerve number nine will do both of those at the back of the tongue, whereas for the anterior two thirds, taste was done by the facial, touch was done by the trigeminal. You see another little structure just here. This is the only muscle that the glossopharyngeal nerve will supply. And this muscle, you can see it's coming from this bony protuberance. This is the styloid process. And it's blending with this, which is meant to be the pharynx. So it's the stylopharyngeus. So the stylopharyngeus is one of our longitudinal muscles of the pharynx that helps to elevate it. The red structure that we've drawn in here, this is meant to be the common carotid artery dividing into the internal and external carotid arteries. And you'll see that there's a little swelling just here called the carotid sinus. We also have a microscopic structure there called the carotid body. Um, and these are both innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So information will be going back via this glossopharyngeal nerve about one, uh, how much oxygen is in the blood and two, what is the pressure? the blood pressure. OK, so we have chemoreceptors here picking up partial pressures of oxygen, uh, mostly. And we have some baroreceptors here picking up the blood pressure. And they're both sending their information back by the glossopharyngeal. In addition to this, we have a little icon here. This is to refer to the gag reflex. Um, and this highlights another function of our glossopharyngeal, which is that it supplies sensory innervation to aspects of the pharynx. So it can detect if there's something in the pharynx that you might choke on. Um, and this is signals coming in via the glossopharyngeal. So that's the sensory limb of this reflex. And then you gag, which is your pharyngeal muscles contract, and that's controlled by the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. So that's the glossopharyngeal nerve. 
Next, we move on to the vagus nerve. So it's going to help you to produce sound, so it innervates the larynx. In addition to that, it's going to help to supply muscles of the palate and also muscles of the pharynx. In terms of, of naming some of these muscles, for the palate muscles, we have palato, glossus, and palato, pharyngeus. For the pharynx, we have salpingo, pharyngeus, and we also have the constrictor muscles of the pharynx. Um, in addition to this, um, the vagus nerves will continue down the neck. They enter the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. So for the heart, for example, they help to decrease the, the heart rate. They also help with constriction of the bronchioli. Uh, when they get into the, the abdomen, some of these fibers will help with peristalsis, so helping to move food along the intestine um, and help with secretion from glands as well. So the parasympathetic functions reducing heart rate, increasing digestion. In addition to this, there's some small functions which are sensory innovation to some of the meninges and a little portion of the ear, uh, but this is the main functions of the vagus. So then we're on to cranial nerve number 11. So this is going to be our sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, which are innervated by the cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve. So our spinal accessory nerve um, is going to run down from what's called the jugular foramen, and it crosses this little space between the two muscles to run on their deep surface. So our sternocleidomastoid is going from the mastoid process there to the sternum and the clavicle, as the name would suggest. The trapezius attaches here to the superior nuchal line and the little bump, the external occipital protuberance, and then it runs down, attaching to the nuchal ligament here in the neck, um, and also the spinous processes all the way down T12. And in terms of what it inserts on, it's going to insert on the clavicle, the acromion process, and the spine of the scapula. So the spinal accessory, just those two muscles, and that's it. The hypoglossal nerve then is our last. This is the 12th, and it's going to supply the muscles of the tongue. So intrinsic muscles of the tongue, which make up the body of the tongue itself. We also have a muscle here attaching to the styloid process, so that's called styloglossus, so attaching to the styloid and running into the tongue. So that helps bring the tongue back into your head and raises up the posterior branch of the tongue. We have the hyoglossus, and this attaches the hyoid to the lateral side of the, the tongue. It helps to depress the tongue to bring it down and also brings it back into your head, retracts it into your head like the styloglossus. The next muscle then is genioglossus. And the genioglossus, as you can see, comes from the internal aspect of the mandible, the chin here, called the mental spine. And then it fans out to attach to the hyoid and also to the underside of the tongue. So when it contracts, it can actually help to protrude the tongue by pulling that bit forward. Um, and it can help to press this posterior part of the tongue as well. So those are the four sort of sets of muscles innervated by the hypoglossal, the styloglossus, hyoglossus, the genioglossus, and also the intrinsic muscles of the tongue itself. So these are the muscle fibers that go longitudinally, vertically, and transversely to help shape the tongue. This little man here, he's referring to the fact that if you want to test the hypoglossal nerve, you stick your tongue out and say, ah, and if the tongue deviates to one side like that, it means that only the one side is working, and usually the tongue will deviate to the bad side. So let's add those cranial nerves into this picture here. So we have an opening, this large irregular opening here called the jugular foramen. And that is where cranial nerves number 9, 10 and 11 will be passing through alongside the structures that will form the internal jugular vein. This little opening that you have just here, that's the hypoglossal canal and that's where cranial nerve number 12 passes through. So you'll find that just to the side of the foramen magnum. 
if we then just look at this finally to add in some of the, the numbers for the nerves that we've done so seven and eight the facial and the vestibular cochlear they run together to pass through the same opening then we have nine ten and eleven and you'll always know eleven because it passes up through the foramen magnum and then exits again through the jugular foramen and then our twelfth the hypoglossal, it comes here from between the olive and the uh, pyramid of the medulla. It passes up and it's going to pass through its own little canal. So that's a summary of the cranial nerves. I hope it was useful.